Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I am happy to be interactive and um, I have three topics to address which are on the screen as we speak um, and I'll pause briefly at the end of each of those. I should also indicate that um, there will be some crossover between what I talk about and uh, the next speaker, David Yates, who is an illustration of some of what we're going to talk about. And then after that, Vera from Mills Oakley is going to talk also about some structural issues. And if I say anything that's incorrect, she'll correct me as we go along. But um, I can speak at the level of operating not-for-profits. Not so uh, my company is what's called an association management company, and we provide a whole set of services for small to medium-sized not-for-profit associations. This will become clearer because it really covers the third of the three topics. It's not meant to be a sales presentation, but more informative, but um, it is indeed what we do for a living. So, first of all, um, so our work is entirely in the not-for-profit sector, and in fact, my clients are all either professional associations, which I suspect most of you are, or their industry associations. We don't have any pure fundraising charities, for example. There's no reason why we couldn't in the future, but as at the current time, we don't have um, you know, medical causes, um, and we don't have unions, and obviously we don't have schools and hospitals, all of which are indeed not-for-profit. Many are. So um, I wanted, first of all, just to talk about the concept of not-for-profit and uh, what you can be within the not-for-profit sector. In 2010, uh, the Australian Productivity Commission uh, undertook a review of the contribution of the not-for-profit sector to the Australian economy, conducted by Commissioner Fitzgerald. And I, I'm just going to give you a few facts that came out of their report. You can get the copy of their report probably still by, by approaching the Commission. Um, I think they provide them free of charge. There's a big thick book, um, but some of the reading in it is quite accessible. Um, they explained that in 2010 there were 600,000 not-for-profit entities in Australia, which I calculate to be approximately one for every 38 people. However, if you can think of a triangle where the smallest number of very big elements are at the top and the very large number of very small elements are at the bottom, Clearly, of those 600,000 organisations, a great number are not incorporated and they may well indeed be a basketball association connected to a church. Well, they could be something quite small, entirely volunteer run, um, without any assets of any significance. However, the, profit, the Productivity Commission also illustrated that with about 59 or 60,000 economically significant entities contributing $43 billion to the Australian uh, gross domestic product and provided 8% of Australia's employment uh, back in 2006-07, which, which was their most recent available data. 4.6 million volunteers uh, represented the equivalent uh, of $15 billion in wages, foregone wages of course because they're volunteers. Um, so uh, they estimated that back in 2010, the not-for-profit sector as a whole uh, was bigger than the Australian retail sector in gross domestic product. It had been previously cited as being greater than the Australian mining sector, but now has grown even bigger to be larger than the Australian retail sector in terms of its contribution to GDP. However, the regulatory framework around not-for-profits was confused and awkward. Um, and you yourselves will know you can be incorporated by your local state government or you can become a company limited by guarantee. And there are some other structures. But what the Productivity Commission said was that the current regulatory framework for the sector is complex, lacks coherence, sufficient transparency, and it's costly to the not-for-profits. It said legislative proposals to reduce the reporting burdens associated with companies many organisations are companies under, under ASIC, uh, are welcomed and needed if more not-for-profits are to adopt Commonwealth incorporation, and we'll come to talk about that. It said that um, um, jurisdictional and agency differences, so all the differences of all the incorporating 
a law around the country resulted in a lack of consistency and comparability in financial reporting requirements. Australian governments should, as a minimum and a priority, implement an agreed standard chart of accounts across the sector. So um, that's just a little introduction from where the not-for-profit sector stood at the time that Commissioner Fitzgerald produced his report. Um, since that time, so we're now three years on, the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission became established. So there was a bit of a, a tug-of-war as to who should take control of the regulatory management of not-for-profits. Should it be the Australian Tax Office? Should it be ASIC? Should it be somebody else entirely? And the sector itself uh, got together and it lobbied very strongly that it should not be the tax office. That it did not see the tax office as an appropriate body to take regulatory control of the not-for-profit sector, even though there were strong taxation issues related to the sector. So indeed, the government set up a new body entirely, rather like ASIC, uh, called the Australian uh, Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission, um, and it's just now really completed its first year or so. Uh, its commissioner is Susan Pascoe, AM. Assistant commissioners David Locke for Charity Services and Murray Baird um, for General Counsel. And then there are eight further directors with um, portfolio responsibilities. I attended a presentation by um, Murray mainly, Murray Baird, about six months ago. And it became very clear to me that I needn't have been in the room because my personal interests are not heavily in the charity itself sector. I'm not heavily involved in fundraising for charities, although on the fringes, many of us uh, and people in this room have a, a charitable element in that we might have a deductible uh, a, a DGR status on one of our funds. We're trying to raise money through donations and not uh, be taxed for it and not have the donor tax for it. So. Um, uh, we are interested in charities, but as far as the Commission is concerned, they're a long way away from incorporating bodies like yours into the AECNC um, unless they actually have charitable status. So they're doing their work, they're beavering away, getting somewhere, and their first tranche of, of work is with pure charities. It's taken those on. And it's already, in the last months, called for the very first reports from charities to the ACNC to, to actually lodge their annual reports. So they lodge them with the ACNC uh, as, a, as an innovation. So for the time being, if your association doesn't qualify as a charity, as I've described, then you are still working either with your local state incorporated, incorporating agency, um, like um, Fair Trading in New South Wales or Consumer Affairs in Victoria, or, you, or your company limited by guarantee, presumably, uh, and you're under the control of Corporations Act and ASIC. The other innovation that's occurred in the last um, few couple of years has been that the, um, the law has introduced a three-tiered system so that smaller organisations don't have the burdensome requirements uh, for reporting as large organisations. So more than three years ago, you could be a small organisation. If you were incorporated as a company limited by guarantee with ASIC, then you had the same reporting re requirement um, responsibilities as BHP in Australia or, you know, some other large corporation. I don't think BHP does that much reporting in Australia anymore, but you know what I mean. So they had this tier one approach where Organisations over a million dollars were still required by law to be audited and they were still required to lodge that audited statement with ASIC. If they had income between 250000 and a million, they were described as Tier 2. And they did not have to be audited by law. They could undertake something called an audit review, which is a, a less burdensome form of, um, of audit. And then below 250000 they didn't have to be audited at all. But I say this subject to whatever your constitution says. If your constitution says you have to be audited, well, then you have to be audited because they're the rules of your association. But the government doesn't say you have to be audited. So really, it's a trade-off between what the government says and what your members say and whether indeed you, you're at a point where you can change your constitution to um, avoid some of the burdensome reporting. I'm just not sure what my... Okay, so 
Now, uh, the, the, the last part of this little section of my presentation is just talks about the difference between state and Commonwealth incorporation, and I'm sure Vera later will cover this in much better detail and better, uh, from a better legal framework. But if you're, if you're incorporated at the state level with someone like Fair Trading or to, to Consumer Affairs or whatever your state of home is, then you are, have been experiencing certain benefits but certain limitations. And the benefits include, well, it didn't cost much to get set up. And you don't have to do much reporting. For example, um, the really smaller end associations can pretty much report. In fact, in, I think in some states there's no report required, but uh, certainly in the states I know uh, that my clients are involved with, there is some reporting. But it can be done on a, two, on a double sided piece of A4. So you confirm who your public officer, or these days we call it the secretary, is and how they're to be contacted. And there might be a, a bit of financial reporting, but it might be limited to seven lines. Uh, you know, how much membership income, how much other income, what are your major expenses and what did you, surplus or deficit, occurred at the end of the year. So, and it might also have a, a um, a statement that says we held an annual general meeting and somebody signs to say that we that we ran it and it was run effectively with a quorum. Um, the other advantage is that you don't have to write a constitution, which can be perhaps not expensive in terms of money, but perhaps in terms of effort and frustration. And uh, therefore, these agencies frequently offer something called model rules, which can either be an example on how to write your constitution, or they can just be something that you simply adopt. If you adopt the model rules, well, that is your association's rules. And it might say you have to vacate the office, office positions every year at the annual general meeting and elect new people, and that might be a problem. You might rather have two-year terms, but you can't. If you want two-year terms, you need to have your own constitution. But it is very convenient to have these model rules available if you're happy to go along with them. However, there are disadvantages, and uh, this is where the legal side of it becomes much more um, important. And that is that if you're incorporated by state law, then you really only have coverage for state activity. Um, and it's intended for state activity. So if you're the Victorian Primary School Teachers Association, then clearly you're comfortable to operate in Victoria because, uh, because that's where your membership lives. They don't live anywhere else. Um, and therefore, if something goes wrong or if there's some requirement for a legal process, it can be covered under the laws of Victoria. However, if you're the uh, Australian um, Institute of Chemistry and your members come from all over the country and you're incorporated in Victoria and something should go wrong in the state of Queensland, then you have an issue because you're incorporated in Victoria and you're really only covered under Victorian law. So it's okay for associations that are state-based, but it's not such a good structure for organisations that operate nationally. And you and I both know, because I'm sure it applies to some of you, many of you are incorporated by state, but are operating nationally. Um, so then there is a sort of a halfway point called um, an Australian registered body, and you can apply for, if you're a state-based incorporation, you can apply for something called an Australian registered body number, and that will give you that national coverage. And it's designed to give you some of the benefits of both being state incorporated and being nationally operating. Um, but in a way, it's not a particularly comfortable outcome, in my opinion, because whilst it gives you that national coverage, it means you still have to do the state report on the piece of A4, but you also have to tell ASIC everything you're doing with regard to changes of office bearers and changes of address and uh, your financial state. So um, it says here, um, the procedure of the Australian Registered Body Number process has the aim of regulating state and territory based bodies when they commence to carry on business outside their place of registration. Section 601 CA of the Corporations Law provides that a registrable Australian body, that is an incorporated association, may not carry on business interstate unless it's been registered under this division. So um, the next speaker, David Yates from the Australian Entomological Society uh, has worked with us and he has also worked with Vera on the process of moving from state incorporation to becoming a company limited by guarantee. 
So the last part of this little bit of uh, section of my talk is about that process. So if you feel that you are operating nationally and you feel you do want to become a company limited by guarantee, well, the good news is the reporting obligations are no longer as great. It's not such a horrendous thing, and a small to medium association can reasonably well manage the uh, reporting requirements. First of all, yes, you do have to lodge changes of directors and changes of address, um, but you can do it online. So if somebody's learned how to do it, it's not a difficult process. I'm a, a registered ASIC agent, and I make... I update uh, ASIC registers for about 15 or 16 organisations and it doesn't take up any of my week. The, um, the second thing is that you, if you're tier, one, uh, tier 3, you don't have to report. So there's no getting the audit, to, audit done by a certain date because if you do have to lodge an audit, you have to do it within four months of the end of the financial year. And sometimes that's a burden itself for a committee to arrange for the audit and have it done and approved by the by the end of the fourth month. So you don't have to do that. Yes. When you say you don't have to report, do you mean there's no report of any audit with Tier 3? Correct. Okay. With ASIC. Correct. You're not required to report your financials under 250000 income. Um, so if you do want to make that move, um, the first recommendation I'll make, and Vera will be pleased to hear this, is I strongly recommend you seek the support of a law firm. Now, there's a simple reason for that. It's not that, it's not that the administrative aspects of making the change are, are horrendous. It's much more important than that. It's because you're going to need a new constitution. And if you're going to develop a new constitution, it's critical that the objects that are stated in the constitution are correctly aligned to what you want to achieve. If they're not, you, you will find it very difficult later on to seek tax exemption or to become DGR accredited if you want to become a, have to start a deductible gift recipient fund, that is one where people donate over $2 and get a tax benefit for it, then you have to apply for that, obviously. And the first thing that the, that the tax office will do is look at your objects. And if your objects don't meet the requirements of a charity to, to the extent that they define a charity, then you won't get the status. So that's the reason why using a law firm is a good idea, because they know what the tax office is looking for. Um, obviously, the new constitution has to meet the requirements of the Corporations Act. It's not just a case of copying model rules. Um, and um, it also needs to contain what we call not-for-profit clauses. So there's a th what the tax office calls a three-way test as to whether you're not-for-profit. Uh, one is that you have a clause that says no shareholder, no, no member, may be paid a dividend. So you cannot distribute the funds of a not-for-profit society to people as a dividend. You can pay them for work they do, but you can't give them a payout as a dividend. Similarly, if you're going to close the association, any residual funds must go to a, to a like not-for-profit. And the last one is that you must be operating substantially within Australia. So that's the three-way test for being called not-for-profit as opposed to a charity. A lot of people don't quite understand that distinction. You can be not-for-profit without being a charity, um, but to be a charity is something else. Okay, so are there any questions that you'd like from me, or you can save them up for Vera later if you prefer, or David for that matter, but just on the topic of what is not-for-profit and how are you structured? Yes. I guess one question I have is, is not so much about the income, but about the capital. I mean, is there any restriction on the amount of capital that a not-for-profit can hold? Yes, there is, and <coughs> it, the de definition is a factor of both income and assets. So, um, I think in the tier, I'm not sure, Vera, I think in the tier one, two and three system it's all about income. It is, yes. Yeah, but in the incorporations process, if in Victoria, for example, they have what's called a prescribed association. So a small association with less than about $150,000 worth of income and less than 100000 in assets doesn't have to do more than the A4 page. But if you're bigger than that and you've got assets of 250000 or something, then you might have to lodge your own financial reports. You just send them in. Yes? I've got a very simple question. Um, I, I, I think it is. <laughs> I hope so. 
the advantages or differences between being a, just a, a loose organisation, well, I mean a structured organisation, and um, an incorporated body. We're, we're, we're wondering, should we become incorporated? What, why? What, what do we get out of it? Is, is it? Are we better off, worse off? Uh, so you're not incorporated at all? No. Okay, so uh, this is a question that, I, Pat Vera, you should perhaps address when you, your turn comes around. But the quick answer to that is, uh, if you're not incorporated, then you don't enjoy the privileges of protection. So you, as a, as a committee member, are personally liable for anything that goes wrong. If you incorporate, then by definition of the word, I don't know all the Latin roots, but corpus, body, um, if you become incorporated, then your organisation becomes an entity in its own right, and that entity can sue, it can be sued, it can own property without referring to the individuals inside it that, that manage it. So you are personally being protected by the fact that you are a part of a body which has, its, which has an entity of its own. Well, we, we have professional indemnity insurance already. Yes. So, as, as a non-incorporated body. It, it just, well, it just, means that, it just means that you don't have an entity that can represent itself as a legal entity. Your organisation is not recognised by the Australian government as a legal entity. You, you may see it as a legal entity and you might uh, have a letterhead with a name on it, but um, if it comes to some sort of legal action, they cannot sue your organisation, They can because it doesn't exist. They can only sh sue the people within it. And your insurance may well protect them to some extent, but you see the difference between the two. So Vera, would you be good enough to address that question more legally? Thanks so much. Okay, moving on. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, you've mentioned incorporation in the States. Yes. I wondered about the territories yes. here, in the, here we're in the ACT. And the double barrel question, I'm from a small incorporated association that is operating in New Zealand, and whether you could remark, as well as Australia, um, whether you could remark on that as well. Um, uh, not very well, but I, uh, all I can say is that uh, the Australian government can have no control over what goes on in New Zealand, uh, and, and vice versa. So um, if you have members from New Zealand, well, that's all well and good. There's nothing to stop you from having members in, from New Zealand or having operations in New Zealand, but they don't come under Australian law. Which implies perhaps we should be incorporated in New Zealand as well. Is that correct? Potentially. Yeah. Okay. And what about the territories as opposed to the states? I think we're probably... You can get in the Yeah, and I think... I certainly know you can in the ACT. In fact, the ACT has a rather special form of incorporation which can give you some of the privileges of national operation. But um, I'm not an expert in that. Okay, so that, yeah, I, that wasn't that was the worst answer. To the question. Well, I think the reason it was incorporated in the ACT was because it was always a national. Yes. I, yeah. Yes. The second topic is uh, regards what we what I call strategic management. So um, you'll understand most of you, I think, come from relatively small associations. If I say small, I mean you're probably not. Um, well over a million dollars in income and you're um, probably operating with either no paid help or some paid help but probably not a large amount of paid help. Which means that uh, volunteerism is a really important part of what you do. Uh, obviously your committees, your boards uh, are, are mostly uh, populated by volunteers and then a lot of what you do outside of that is also dependent upon volunteer input. But it's important to recognise the difference between a person who's a board member when they're in a board meeting and that same person when they're out raising money or when they're out uh, standing at a trade fair or when they're out speaking to a group about science. So. Um, when they're not in a board meeting, they're not really a board member. I mean, they're not there because they're a board member and they're not, they don't have some superior controlling function because they happen to also sit on the board. When they're in the boardroom, they have a function as a board member. And that function, we hope, is to manage the organisation strategically and 
um, organisations that are managed strategically, we would say, become high performance. And I'll try and explain what I mean by that. So managing small to medium not-for-profits can be fraught with confusion when board members are sometimes board members, sometimes subcommittee members, sometimes volunteer workers, and sometimes supervising staff members. It's desirable that at board members, the board is not drawn into the operational detail that, uh, may, that they may have been exposed to when undertaking operational activities or industry chit-chat. Without naming names, I can tell you about a board, for example, that in 10 years has not changed much either in personnel and definitely not in content. They're still talking about the problem that they had 10 years ago. And... Uh, and very often they also talk about industry issues which are important, but really their members would like to be hearing about as well. But because they're on the board, they get to talk about it, and the members might get something next month, but not very much. So it's a really n not a strategically managed operation. A high-performance board is able to focus on the strategic management of the association. So boards make decisions. Subcommittees make recommend recommendations to boards. The officers fill various roles at various times. Sometimes they're a subcommittee member, sometimes they're a board member, sometimes they're a volunteer out doing work. If you have an executive officer or a chief executive officer, their role is to implement the decisions of the board as far as possible. If that person can't implement them on their own, it might be that volunteers join them to help them. But in that instance, they're not board members, they're volunteer workers and they shouldn't behave as board members in that instance. And staff, if you're lucky enough to have more staff than the executive officer, they support the role of the executive officer in delivering on the decisions of the board or on the plan. Uh, if you're really interested to learn more about the separation of a board and the operations, then you could look up um, the policy governance model by John and Miriam Carver, as an example, Canadians who wrote extensively in this area. They're not the only ones, there have been others since, but basically they advocate that a board makes decisions and they pass those to the Chief Executive Officer and the Chief Executive Officer delivers on those requirements with their staff and there's a barrier in between the two. The board don't come down and tell the financial person how to do the books and the marketing representative on the board doesn't come down and work with the membership development manager in the thing, except by approval as a voluntary capacity, but not as a board member. The role of the board is to remain within the board. So strategic management is the framework we live by in managing the association. So up on the, up on the, the uh, screen here, you can see in the middle, you can see some documents, the strategic plan, the operational plans, and a budget. And um, around it, you can see other documents. And the whole idea of the st strategic management model is to understand how this framework clicks together. Because if it doesn't click together, then you don't have a high performance association. So if we start with a strategic plan, which is clearly developed by the board as the long term plan for what, where we're going to be in three years and how we're going to get there. And from that, maybe subgroups develop the operational plans which feed into but must be aligned to the strategic plan. And then the budget, of course, supports that. So if you, th you, you perhaps we should, some of us uh, make the mistake of thinking of the budget only as uh, income, less expenditure, or we're not going to go broke. But indeed, the budget provides a much more powerful um, influence in that says where we've agreed to spend our money. Where have we what have we agreed to resource? And if we've agreed to resource it, we need to put it in the budget, and that tells the people where the permissions lie. It doesn't mean they can actually spend the cash, but it means we have the intention of applying those resources to that purpose. So the budget's a very powerful uh, tool in giving people the comfort that they're not stepping beyond their boundaries or outside their portfolios. Strategic management directly connects the strategic goals with the operational plans, and it connects the people and the processes around it together so that they work together. It provides a safe mechanism for change and growth. 
So you, you, you've probably all had the experience at some point, perhaps in past days of your lives, where you've come into a committee or whatever and you really don't know which way is left or right. You don't know what's going on. You don't quite know what authority you have. It's very difficult to know what safe ground you're on, even if you have great ideas. In a strategically managed organisation, this safety exists because the policies, the, poli the, the uh, uh, roles and responsibilities documents, the budget, all of these things hold together correctly so that a person involved in the committee or on the board knows exactly where they fit and what rights they have regardless of any other cliques or hidden agendas. So a board which is strategically managed is bigger than and outlives the tenure of the, any individual or the constitution of that board itself. So this is what we mean by um, high performance. So just to look at the diagram briefly, the strategic plan is developed by the board, sometimes with a facilitator, and it's, it's a long-term plan. It doesn't contain a lot of detail, but it, it, it's an agreement as to exactly what our programs are likely to consist of, what our income streams are likely to be, what our membership is going to look like, whether we're indeed going to have members or we don't need members. It's going to contain all of those high-level decisions. And when the annual general meeting comes around, they're the things that we report on. We don't report on... We don't need to spend a lot of time on fine detail we want the members, the, the stakeholders, to know what are the key things and how are we travelling with them. And then, as I say, the business plans, the budget feed into that, and they're reported differently. They're reported on a more short-term basis and to a different audience. So then let's look at some of these other documents. Oh, before I do, um, I wanted to just use an analogy. When um, uh, most of us drive cars, so... Um, when we, have to, when we have to get a licence, the first thing we're tested for is the rules of the road. Um, we have to study them and we have to get to know them. And by now, you don't think about the rules of the road. They are second nature to you. Um, you, you do know them and you, 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 do behave, you do behave accordingly, but you don't spend a lot of time thinking about what the rules of the road are because it's second nature. Then the next thing we do is we learn how to operate the vehicle. And again, you can be tested as part of the, the, the driving test is, is a test both of how you manage the vehicle and control it for the safety of others and how well you observe the rules of the road. And once you've learnt to drive the vehicle, more and more, it just becomes second nature. You don't think about what your feet are doing or where the indicator uh, paddle is or uh, where the light switch is. You just, these things just all happen. You can, can, can carry on another train of thought while you're doing these things, largely. But what you can't do is know exactly how each journey is going to be. So each time you get out, get out of the driveway in the morning and you drive to work, you might take the same route every single day. You don't think about the rules, you don't think about how to drive the car, but everything else about the journey is different. It could be daytime, it could be night, it could be raining, it could be shine, it could be hail, there could be children on the footpath, that set of traffic lights has turned red when yesterday it didn't. So you have to, you have to engineer or navigate your way through that journey differently on every occasion. So we could say what we're doing is we're managing the exceptions and we're concentrating on the journey, not on the framework around it. So really that's what we, where we're getting to. We're talking about knowing the framework so well and having the framework so well tuned that all we have to do is manage the journey. Um, I think the next slide might... It just helps to support the analogy. So driving a car is knowing how to drive a vehicle and manage its controls. It comes a second nature. How does that relate? Knowing how to run the board meeting and manage the controls comes a second nature. The rules of the road, you learn these once and only once, revise them when things change. The plans, policies and other supporting documents on the previous slide, these provide all the participants with clarity. They know where they stand. But they need to be changed when improvements are recognised. If something's not right in the journey, it's not just the operational plan that changes. You might have to change the roles and responsibilities. You might have to change a policy. So we call these change controls. 
So the individual journey, what's new today, what amazing action shall I take? At each board meeting, we monitor the association's performance and we make adjustments accordingly and we call that the corrective actions process. So if I go back here, you see over here we've got a corrective actions process. So policies, we know what they are. You can have a lot of policies or you can have just a small number. Uh, these days, organisations are really needing to develop more. They're get, developing diversity policies and gender-specific policies and um, um, fi you know, financial delegation policies and all sorts, travel policies. Um, <coughs> marketing plan it really fits in with the operational plans. Marketing plan, communications plan, they can really be included in there. Roles and accountabilities, very important one, because... Um, in a high-performance organisation, we don't have people who say, look, I'm a volunteer, I don't actually have to do this. We only have people who say, I have committed to do this role, and therefore I do have a responsibility to do it. If, I, if I'm not going to give you what I said I was going to give you, then I should get out. So roles and responsibilities are not different from in a paid organisation once somebody commits to provide that service. It's a commitment and therefore they do carry the responsibility until they cease to want to carry the responsibility. And accountabilities, therefore, can exist. So if somebody says, um, look, I'm going to be the membership manager and I'm going to um, build the, or the membership by 2% this year, then that we can divide that down and say we're going to build it by half a percent every quarter. Well, then they shouldn't be offended when at the board meeting in, in March they have a look at the membership numbers to see whether they've grown by half a percent. And if they haven't, well, that's fine. They can say, look, it's been the first half of the year, nothing much happened in January, so we're still perhaps shooting for one percent by mid-year. The point is, nobody's offended by this because there's an agreement that these accountabilities exist. It also introduces the concept of KPIs. So down here, we're going to say there are measures for the things that we say we're going to do. So if membership growth is a KPI, we don't want too many of them, by the way. We don't want 20 KPIs. We only want four or five, perhaps, maximum, that fit with a strategic plan because that's what we're managing. So if we can find four or five KPIs that are simple to develop, simple to collect, easy to report, and are directly aligned to roles and responsibilities, then we're a long way towards a high-performance association. So just to summarise, the strategic plan describes where we are today and where we want to be in the future. It provides us with a map of the journey we're expecting to take and we're going to manage to take. The business plans provide the tactics to achieve the goals of the strategic plan. Policies describe what the organisation's behaviour, what's permitted and what's not. It's aligned with the strategic goals and it provides clarity to everyone who's involved. Um, and I've touched on accountability and I've touched on KPIs. So finally, the corrective action process is an outcome of performance monitoring. If something's not working out, if a goal is not being met, then we can work out why not, then we can take a corrective action. Is it because the policies don't line up or is it because somebody's not meeting a responsibility? Or is it because the operational plan is incorrect or misguided in some way? No big deal. We can change an element. We can just adjust, turn a lever, and try and bring it back into line. So we're adjusting the, the drive from work home to work or work to home by making simple evasive actions as we go. But it's controlled and it's strategic. <coughs> Finally, a high-performance organisation communicates regularly and effectively. People, I'm sure you've all been to a gen AGM where we haven't got enough people putting their hand up to be on the board. And we sort of say, look, we, we, we need a treasurer, we, we really need a treasurer. Uh, there must be someone in the room who's got some uh, minimum financial skills. We're not too fussed about how, how good you are at the finances, but we do need a treasurer. Anyone put their hand up, please? So... Um, the, the difference would be a high-performance association is so well run, is so well put together and constructively managed that it's successful. And that success is constantly communicated in, simply by 
communicating to the members. At the last board meeting, we found the following things. We celebrated the following things. Uh, we made the following decisions. Um, So-and-so's been made a doctorate of whatever. Um, so anything that's positive that's going on is communicated. And I'm not just talking about scientific information. I'm talking about the success of this board in managing. And what that does, of course, is it does create an, a culture of success and people are drawn to success. If something is good and if it is being successful, people are drawn to it. It's a fact. End of section two. Does anybody like to talk about strategic management? Um, with any of the organisations you're involved with, do they have a, um, a, a, um, a formal or informal process of um, giving new board members a clear idea of what's expected of them um, when they come onto the board? Because yeah. often, as boards change, you'll get as younger people come in that don't have board experience, they might not have a clear idea of what's expected of them. That's a great question. I'm sorry I didn't uh, bring it up already. Um, it varies considerably in the extent to which that's done. Most organisations do have some regard for the fact that an incoming board member does need some sort of introductory orientation. I have to say mostly that is like, um, let's give them the minutes of the last five meetings, let's give them a copy of the policies, let's, um, you know, let's, in let's invite them to the, to the meeting before the AGM so they get an idea they can observe. It's that sort of thing. Um, but the best ones are done where the president or the, the, the chairman typically takes responsibility for the well-being of those people and says, this person needs an hour of my time over a coffee just to talk about what's going on, what are the highs, lows, faults, failings. They, want, they need all these documents as well, but they need some of my time as a leader. So clearly there are big implications for leadership. And yes, I think no, none of us wants to go into an environment without orientation if we can possibly help it. So whilst it's a no-brainer, nobody, a lot of people don't do it very well, but some people do. Uh, I'm interested a bit in the KPIs, because <clears throat> I know you talked about four or five KPIs for your, I suppose, your strategic plan. And KPIs can be at the level of strategic plan and then your sort of operations plan in terms of actual actions and what's responsible. And then it can also be at the stage of staff and their performance. But often with KPIs, it's a lot about quality. And KPIs are often very hard to make KPIs for quality. And often with what we do, it really is about how happy members are with our services. and. Um, so I just, I suppose I wondered if you had any advice on KPIs that don't necessarily steer you in your direction in terms of number of media releases versus impact, for example. Yeah, I agree. They're not always quantitative. Qualitative, KPI, qualitative KPIs are equally important. Um, a good one is um, a board, and I should have mentioned this also, but there's only limited time, but a good one is a board that self-assesses. So at the end of a board meeting, the, the, um, the board stops for one minute and they say, well, how did we go today? Did we stick to time? Did everybody come? Did, it, did everybody who came contribute? Did anyone who didn't come give us fair warning that they weren't going to come? Did we make any decisions? And if we did, do we think they're the right ones? And of course, if people think, well, actually, I'm not really sure about that decision we made. They can say so. And it's in the open. It's transparent. So I, I think the answer, best answer to the question is qualitative KPIs are really important because they table the issue. They put it on the table so that it does get discussed and it doesn't get overlooked. Even if it can't have a number put on it, it raises an issue. So that uh, in the case of staff, for example, if you have staff and if they have a staff review, Part of a staff review is, well, are you happy with the organisation, not just are we happy with you? And it's an entirely qualitative question, but it, the power of it is enormous. So I think tabling these qualitative KPIs is very important, in addition to having quantitative ones which are more empirical. Um, but I still hold to the fact that you should not have more KPIs than you can comfortably manage. I've got to move on because I'm due to finish in a few minutes. And I want to go on to the last section, which is what we do for a living. There you go. 
Um, so, different organisations have different sizes. Large organisations have sufficient... Think of the triangle that like we talked about earlier, the 600,000 organisations, small number at the very top. Some of them are huge. Australian Medical Association, the NRMA, RACB, Alfred Hospital, whatever it happens to be. Some of them are really big um, and certainly not uh, in the market that we're in. Um, some of them are so small that they're just managed by a handful of mums and dads and they're also not of great interest in, to this topic today. But small to medium associations, like most of yourselves, have enough resources and enough um, uh, in, in, impetus to need to, rec to pay some people for some things. So you may have an executive officer, you may have a... And I apologise to all the executive officers in the room. Yes? Five minutes? Yep, great. Five minutes. Yep. I apologise to the people in the room who are employees of associations because what I'm about to say is uh, interesting for you. Um, but those who are office bearers uh, will find it especially interesting. Um, but if you have a small number of staff, then clearly one person or half a person can't be an accountant and a graphic designer and a database manager and a technology person and a membership development manager all in one. If such a person was available, they'd be a remarkably clever person. You can, of course, outsource your, your, your accounting. You can outsource uh, your graphic design. You can outsource and all sorts of things, the IT but then you pay an outsourced price for each of those individual things by going to IT companies or accounting firms. So the big organisations typically have their own office, their own staff, so let's leave them out for the moment. The rest of us um, have, an, have, a, have an executive officer or one or two staff in a small rented office over the, above the bakery or working from home or in a, in a, a what do you call, shared office service um, because there, isn't, there aren't the resources to own buildings and all that sort of thing. Um, there's a new movement called association management companies. It's very common in Europe, it's very common in the United States, but it's less com common here. My company, PAMS, P-A-M-S, Pro Professional Association Management uh, Services, is an association management company. Some people in the sector are called PCOs, professional conference organisers. We're not one of those. We're an association management company. So we look after all the administrative services, accounting, newsletters, board meetings, annual general meetings, um, a membership, database, website, social media, whatever it is that you would want an executive officer and their staff to run. We do that as an outsourced operation. Well, of course, we have one office and we pay one set of rent. We have one internet connection, not 30. We have 30 clients, but we only have one internet connection. We have, we have servers that serve all of our clients. We have printing machines that are used by all of our clients, and so it goes on. So we are, if you like, an economy of scale for small associations. We provide their rent, the IT infrastructure. We have the telephone system. Uh, and we have staff who are not-for-profit oriented. They're trained in not-for-profit issues. They understand not-for-profit. We don't have any clients that are not not-for-profit. Um, and we go outside when we need legal help or we need taxation help. We don't employ those people. And it works because a small association like um, the entomologist, David's about to speak, um, can dial the number for the entomologists and the phone will be answered 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, by a real person, even though they might only, and I'm not referring to the entomologist here, but they might only be paying for perhaps uh, two days a week in terms of, in terms of uh, size. So they get a full, a full service, full time, in, a, in, a, um, in an office of people who know what they're doing. So um, that's, that's economies of scale. Essentially, by outsourcing their operations, they know that the financial reports will be ready by the 15th day of the next month, every month, without fail. They do know that their emails are not going out from Outlook with 500 names in the blind copy field. They're being sent out by an email marketing tool, which will distribute them one at a time, addressed to Dear Mary, Dear John, Dear Eric that are trackable, that we can go back and track how many people read this email, how many people opened the link in it, and so on. Um, and it overcomes the issue of 
the alternative where you run partly by paid people, partly by volunteers, where backups are not performed rigorously, or um, and when you when your executive officer leaves, um, then the board has to have the ability and skill to find a new person, train them, and you lose, of course, that continuity. Whereas very often with an office, they contain the continuity that the board sometimes doesn't contain. So I've had to push that little topic through very quickly, but if anyone would like to know more about it, please, now's the time to ask a question. There's a dollar cost, obviously. How, how do you charge for that service? Uh, well, I, I dare say I can't speak for other companies. What we do is we come up with a fixed price. So my, part of my background was in the t information technology industry, and um, I learnt working for um, some big companies that fixed pricing was very attractive. When, when somebody comes along and says, I want to buy something, rather than being told, well, it's so much per hour, you say, well, how many hours? You say, well, we don't know, actually. So you can't actually put aside $20,000 for a new journal program or a new exhibition program because you don't know you're going to have that 20000 available. So we fix price it. So you and I would sit down together and we'd say, this is what we think we need, this is how much it's going to take in time, and we are prepared to put a price on that. And at the end of the year, if we've got it wrong, we'll come and we'll talk about it. But nine times out of ten, we work within it. So... Um, I've got 30 clients, and in they're mostly on five-year terms. They're all fixed price, and I've only have had one experience in my 10 years doing this of going back to a client and said, I'm really sorry to do this, but we are your sponsor, not your provider. Um, and they understood what was going on, and we made some adjustments. But mostly we work within the fixed price. It means you can budget for membership programs. Can you give us ballpark figures for your fixed price? I can't possibly because it varies incredibly. We have clients that pay us $7,000 a year and we have clients that pay over $200,000 a year. So it depends entirely on how big they are, how many services they want, if they want us to run all their meetings, the board meetings, their annual general meetings, travel interstate, represent them at meetings, represent them at exhibitions, run their conference. You know, it's just impossible. No two clients are the same. Any more? With that, I think we'll put our hands together and thank you very much for having us.